on 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. It's 7.06. It's O'Connor and Company on this 14th day of May. This is Flag Day. It's also President Trump's birthday. And we wish him a good one as he embarks upon his attempt for re-election this year. Uh, also coming up in this program at 735, Mike Clancy, who is uh, looking to be the congressman from Virginia's 10th district. And then at 805, Congressman Mike Cloud of Texas, who was in the room yesterday when Donald Trump came into D.C. to meet with Capitol Hill Republicans. I'm Larry O'Connor with Patrice Sanwuka. Good morning. Happy Friday, Larry. Yeah, happy Friday to you, whatever the heck. I, I still don't quite understand what Friday means, but we're going to go with it. Joining, <laughs> joining us right now. <laughs> Um, as promised, we spoke about this quite a bit earlier in the program to set this up, but I want to set the stage a little bit more. Uh, he is the former chief of police for the United States Capitol Police Force. He was in that position from 2019 to 2021. He is the author of the book Courage Under Fire, Under Siege and Outnumbered 58 to 1 on January 6th. He is Stephen Sund, and he joins us now. Chief Sund, thanks for being here. My pleasure. It's always a pleasure to join both you, uh, you and Patrice, and happy Flag Day and happy Friday. Yeah, thank you for that. You and and listen, well. this is also, by the way, the anniversary of the Alexandria baseball shooting. And I know that as mm. the chief of police for uh, Capitol Police, um, you were you were involved in that. I know uh, the U.S. Capitol Police officers were present and engaged in that event. And, and I want to get to that in a little bit, though, because <laughs> well, we, we booked you to come on the program to talk about that. But then this video of Nancy Pelosi was released this week. And just to remind everybody, this was from the sixth day of January as she was being whisked away from the Capitol. We have responsibility, Terry. We did not have any accountability for what was going on there, and we should have. This is ridiculous. You're gonna ask me in the middle of the thing when they've already breached the, the uh, inaugural stuff that, that uh, uh, should we call the Capitol Police? I mean, the uh, National Guard? Why weren't the National Guard there to begin with? All right, we're going to continue the tape in a moment, but I want to pause right there, and I want to ask you, Chief Sun, when you saw this video and you saw Nancy Pelosi wondering out loud why wasn't the National Guard there, what crossed your mind? Because you have the answer to that question. Oh, absolutely have the answer to the uh, question. My phone blew up Tuesday when that video uh, when that video came out. The people just got to go back and look at uh, there's a law to U.S. 1970 that Congress passed that as the chief of police, I'm required to go even in advance and get congressional approval, get approval from the Capitol Police Board to bring in any federal resources to help the men and women of my police department. I did that twice on January 3rd and twice was denied uh, by both the House and Senate sergeant at arms. Uh, so there's a direct responsibility with uh, with leadership and the lack of uh, preparedness in advance. And then even while we're under attack, I'm still required to go and by law get that permission. And for 71 minutes, I was denied that permission uh, wow. by the House Sergeant Arm. And, and and along those lines, what, what time was it when you actually finally did get permission to get the National Guard deployed? 2.09 p.m. But mm -hmm. my understanding is they didn't get there until well after 5 p.m. Is that correct or, or am I wrong on that? No, you are 100% correct. So 2.09 p.m., I finally get approval. And people don't realize this. Even before I received approval, I was calling in every chief of police I knew uh, to send mm. me resources. And at 12.49, I went ahead and called the National Guard. I called William Walker at the National Guard and said, listen, uh, uh, Commander, um, I should have permission any minute now. Please send me whatever you got. Because there was 180 National Guard troops within eyesight of the Capitol. Think about that. Wow. So at 149, I call him. 2.09, I get permission. 234, I get on the call with the Pentagon begging them to send me. They're asking me, do I, do I need National Guard support? They're seeing the same thing I'm seeing on TV. Um, so I tell them repeatedly, yes, this is an urgent need for National Guard support. Uh, Lieutenant General Pyatt, uh, I, I'll never forget this uh, for the rest of my life, says, you know mm -hmm. what? My rec First of all, he tells me the same thing Paul Irving told me on uh, Sunday. I don't like the optics of the National Guard standing in line at the Capitol. Hmm. Um, so he tells me his recommendation is not to approve my request. I could, I was dumbfounded. Uh, Mayor Bowser was on the call. Chief Conti was on the call. A number of other people um, were on the call with me. But needless to say, the Pentagon wasn't sending any resources to help me, even though they're sending resources to the general's home to protect them. It, wow. They didn't deploy National Guard. Those 180 troops that were within eyesight, 
were actually moved over to the D.C. Armory, which is on the other side of the Capitol, waited yeah. for evening relief to come in. The evening relief was put on a bus, and they arrived at 5.40 p.m. Oh after, all, after all the fire was over. Yeah, so it's, can I... it's crazy. So, so it doesn't surprise me now that she's, you know, it's, it's good to hear that she finally is accepting responsibility, and she did it that yeah. day. Um, at, least, at least Alexandria Pelosi's um, you know, video is coming in handy somewhere. Exactly. You know, it, it's it's so sad that your testimony was not part of the J6 committee hearing, but I want to take one step back. What intelligence did you have going in before the, the day before, let's say January 5th, that that raised your alarm to say we should request for um, for 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 um, uh, make make this request uh, for National Guard uh, support. I mean, did you have intelligence that something could have erupted coming out of the the the, the, the rally, or was it just you know what I, I'm seeing that there are a lot of people. Let's just be safe. I mean, what what did you think was the? Why did you think you needed to request the support in advance? That's a, a great uh, question, Patrice. Um, I've been doing events in Washington, D.C. for for decades, major events, everything from IMF to um, um, inaugurations. I knew when I have a joint session of Congress taking place uh, on Capitol Hill, I've got both sessions, uh, both House and uh, Senate in session. I have the vice president up there. takes a lot of my staffing inside. I have limited staffing for the the perimeter. I had a couple uh, couple hundred CDU officers that were going to be out there, but I still wanted more. All I wanted was unarmed National Guard. I don't need more guns. I just need personnel to help people from jumping the fence. Uh, Mm -hmm. So it was based on that. Hey, this, you know, Congress has now put out five uh, reports, and they all say the same thing. This was a devastating intelligence failure. Uh, the intelligence I was getting was 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 minimal. It was going to be just like the two previous MAG reports. Even my uh, my deputy chief for intelligence was briefing members of Congress the day before, saying this was going to be just like the two other the uh, two other um, MAG events. Yeah, mm-hmm. we're speaking with Steve Sun. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chief. I was, I was going to say, so it's just based on my experience and my need. My, you know, I knew I was going to have a lightly um, staffed perimeter and just wanted mm-hmm. more people on it. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, we're speaking with Steve Sun. He is the former chief of police for the Capitol Hill Police. And we're talking, obviously, about this uh, video that's come out of Nancy Pelosi, which, uh, you know, again, was not part of the January 6th hearing. And, uh, Chief, I don't remember seeing you in the primetime presentations. Did you give a... <laughs> A closed door deposition, and they decided not to bring you in front of the cameras, or or what was your involvement? Because I would think you would be a key witness for the January sixth select committee. Yeah, I've done a lot of investigations. You'd think, huh? Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, it was a long time. It wasn't until I think um, uh, August that they finally got around to interviewing me, and they only want to do it behind closed doors. And um, I write about this in the book because it got it, it very confrontational in the interview because mm-hmm. they did not want a single word that that um, uh, indicated any responsibility for any type of leadership. They didn't want to, uh, for the Capitol Police Board, anything like that. I want to talk to them about the denial. Um, they're like, did he really deny you? Did, did Paul Irving really deny He didn't approve me. I mean, if you go to your parents, right. you say, hey, Dad, you yeah. <laughs> and, and Dad, Yeah, he didn't part. deny you, Chief. He just didn't approve it. Come on, get it right. See, this is the problem. And, You're not in politics. You don't know how these things work. All right. Well, yeah. a little bit more with Chief Stephen Sund, and uh, and we also also want to talk about the shooting on the Alexandria baseball field, which was uh, today is the anniversary of that event too. So uh, keep it here. Uh, we're not even going anywhere. In fact, it's seven fifteen. WMAL making sense of the news live from the Home Paramount Pest Control Studios. Home Paramount, the leader in pest control since nineteen thirty nine. Nancy Pelosi turned down 10,000 soldiers if she didn't do that. But and now Nancy I understand, Pelosi doesn't have the I understand that, that you the police testified against her. Listen to me, Kristen. Listen to me. I understand that the police testified against her, the chief very strongly against mm-hmm. her, Capitol Police, great people. They testified against her, and they burned all the evidence. Okay, they burned all the evidence. That was Donald Trump speaking with Kristen Welker uh, meet the press. And yeah, it, I don't know if they burned it, but they destroyed a big chunk of the evidence that they gathered on the J6 Select Committee. That point he was making there, though, echoing what you have always said, that the sergeant at arms acting on behalf of the Speaker of the House, that's his job. He's in charge of House security. He serves at the Speaker's pleasure. He did not authorize and approve your request for the National Guard that day, Chief. 
When Kristen Welker follows up and says, well, she doesn't have the power you have as commander in chief. Can you sort through uh, the law here? Uh, because you, you are familiar with this, knowing how things operate with the various agencies represented in Washington, D.C., and the park police and all of those things. And then the military and the National Guard. Could Donald Trump pick up the phone and say, send in the troops? So what what you're dealing with is there's there's two two things that have to happen. One, this is something that's called uh, DISCA, the Defense Support for Civil Authorities. Uh, what, what the Department of Defense doesn't realize is I've actually taught that for the Defense Institute of Legal Studies. Uh, that is what the um, Donald Trump kind of controls, where the governors have uh, control over the National Guard in the states. In the District of Columbia, it's the president uh, that has been delegated down to the uh, Secretary of Defense who delegated it down to the Secretary of Army. So that's one section. The other section is what I was talking about is that 2 U.S. 1970. So for me to request it, they have to have a request from a civil authority to send in any National Guard. That civil authority would be me. But for me to make that request, I have to be approved under 2 U.S. 1970, which is the law I talked to you about. I have to go and get approval from the Capitol Police Board and congressional leadership to bring in those resources. I could never get that approval. And what and what's interesting is I was listening to them say, you know, they burned the evidence. They actually the, – the evidence – if they went and changed the law. December of, of 2021, they went ahead and changed the law, and now the chief has unilateral authority to bring in federal resources. So wow. if if I wasn't wrong, why did you change – you know, if I was wrong, why did mm. you change the law? Right. Uh, mm. So that's that's all the proof you need right now. They realized okay. it, and they changed the law. And and, and quickly, though, and, and just in, in a short answer, um, President Trump proactively ahead of the – January 6th events said, if the request comes in for troops, I authorize this. But he couldn't, like, as he was seeing things go down on January 6th, he couldn't call in troops there to act in a domestic fashion, could he? Is is he even allowed to constitutionally do that? You know, I, I believe because there's there's something in the Defense Support for Civil Authority called the Emergency Response Authority that gives the commanding general of the National Guard the permission in, under the exact type of things we're dealing with on January 6th to deploy uh, okay. and then seek presidential. So I think the president could have provided some, some type of assistance under that act. Okay. But you have the mayor that was uh, produced, I think, January 4th that said no additional federal agents or National Guard without the approval of the Metropolitan Police Department and her. Uh, then you had the Secretary of the uh, Defense putting out the restrictions on the uh, Department of the National Guard. So I think all that kind of uh, lined up against uh, any any capability for the, gotcha. the commanding general, president to act. Thank mm. you. That 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 helps uh, educate us on this. Thank mm. you. So, Chief Sun, we, we actually originally booked you to talk about <laughs> today being the, <laughs> the anniversary of the Alexandria baseball shooting. And, and you know what? This conversation so far has been amazing. Uh, but take us back to that day. You know, what was it? What was it? Um, what were your feelings? What were your emotions? You know, knowing that, you know, <laughs> your job is to make sure that members of Congress are safe. And we mm-hmm. almost lost um, a member, a high ranking member of Congress uh, that, that day due to, you know, the craziness of, of someone with, um, with a weapon. Yeah, so I'd like um, let me let me take your your listeners back to a, a really interesting story. So at the time, I was the assistant chief of operations for the Capitol Police. I'd just come on. I'd just been on a couple of months. Mm-hmm. When I got the call, I got a call from my deputy chief saying the shooting had occurred. Chief Verderosa went down to Alexandria to uh, take control of that scene, and I'd gotten word that several of the injured were being moved to the Washington Hospital Center. Um, mm-hmm. Where I, you know, I headed up there. You know, after being with the Washington D.C. Police Department for 25 and a, and a half years, I knew that area very well. So I knew we were going to have to set up operations and a security detail at the hospital. So I responded up there. Uh, when I got into MedStar, uh, the ICU at MedStar, I was met by a U.S. Park Police aviation medic who I'd gotten to know during my time with MPD, and he came over to me. Um, he had just walked out of one of the one of the ICU rooms, and he said, "Chief, you need to go and probably say a couple of words to your officer. It doesn't look good at all." And I still remember this day walking in to, to say some words. I thought it was going to be Crystal Griner, and it was Steve Scalise. Um, mm-hmm. And I went, wow. And the security detail was there, and we just, you know, just I just kind of backed out for a little bit. And he was in that grave of, of danger. And and it, it, people just don't realize that. But, yeah, it's something else. I was just, you know, David, uh, David Bailey and Crystal Griner, the two agents that were there, uh, I'm glad they were there. I'm glad they acted heroically. Uh, it was David Bailey that finally um, uh, negated um, – Hodgkinson, the uh, left leftist activist uh, that started yeah. shooting the Republicans, um, but it is it is a tough, tough day. And then 
you know, I'll, I'll tell you this. The other thing that I find interesting is there was a report that came out from Alexandria, and it was Brian Porter, the uh, attorney general for Alexandria, that got this right. And I think the report came out just like six months after the shooting where he labeled it as a terrorist incident. Even though the mm-hmm. FBI wanted to say it was a random act of violence and had nothing to do with the uh, Republicans, they, fi- they finally changed that years later. But I just thought that would be an interesting story you'd like to hear. No, it wow. is. It absolutely is. Amazing. And we, and we you know, sadly, we try to memory hold these things in the media because mm-hmm. uh, this was an assassination attempt. A, a yes. man tried to kill as many Republican congressmen as he possibly could that day. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. And it was yep. the Capitol Hill police officers who did an incredible, as they did, by the way, at the baseball game the other night. They did provided fin- fantastic security as we had those uh, pro-Hamas protesters yep. and climate change radicals trying to disrupt <laughs> things. Right. The other uh, thing I was going to mention, is, yeah. you had mentioned it was the president's birthday. I'll tell you, President Trump and Melania, I'd gotten a call from the Secret Service saying the president was thinking of coming over. He arrived at the hospital probably right around between 8 and 9. Uh, mm. Never said a word that was his birthday. I never realized it was his birthday until uh, probably the very next day. Uh, and spent two hours talking with Crystal Griner, talking with you know some of the other injured, uh, talking with the hospital staff. Um, it was very nice, very gracious of the two of them. Wow. Chief Sun, one other quickie on this Pelosi video. It ends with this. Responsibility for not having them, just prepare for more. Yeah, I take responsibility for not having them and prepare for more. That's what she was saying at that moment. But then within 12 hours, um, she asked for your resignation. And, and you gave it. And I've always wanted to ask you this, sir. We've interviewed you several times. I've spoken to you. Why did you, why did you resign? Why, why, when she said, that's it, you're, you're responsible, I'm threat. You knew she was throwing you under the bus. You knew the truth. When she asked for your resignation, why, did you say, why didn't you say, hell no, I'm not taking the so, fall for this. I'm going yeah. to tell the truth because you, you, you get my scalp. I'm not going to help you cover up the truth. Well, I'll tell you, hindsight being, being 2020 at the time, uh, you know, it, it had been a rough uh, 36 hours. I hadn't slept at all. Uh, mm. I, I conferred with my, uh, my boss at home, my wife, <laughs> and I thought long and hard about it. And I thought about my troops. Uh, and that's the only reason I was like, you know, you know, being thrown under the bus, that's the Washington, D.C. way. OK, but I'll tell you, if I knew what I did, to, if I knew now what I knew, if I, yeah, if I knew then what I knew now, I think that comes from a, a song. Yeah. Uh, I, I would have fought this all the way. Mm. Well, listen, wow. one man in this whole scenario has had the exact same story consistently from the moment it happened, January 6th. That was Chief Stephen Sund, and you've just heard it right from his own mouth. And by the way, have there been a lot of media requests to talk to you after this video came out? Um, I'm, I'm thinking I'm, I'm talking on, with Vince uh, this afternoon. Vin, uh, oh, okay, there's, okay. There's... <laughs> Well, we got WMAL. We're we're on yeah, the scene. Yeah, we're all over it. But yeah, yeah. All right. Meanwhile, MSNBC had Nancy Pelosi on, and she claimed that this is revisionist history. I, I would think hmm. if they really wanted the truth out, they'd get your perspective as well, Chief. Exactly. But uh, we're happy to do that. I, I appreciate always talk, uh, always being getting the opportunity to talk with you. Thank you, sir. Thank Same you here. So much, sir. That is Stephen Sund, a really important voice in this whole story. That still, you know. Mm. Everyone says, let's get to the truth. We want the American people to know what happened on January 6th. Yeah, so do we. Exactly. And that's why we speak with Chief Sund and others. Now on 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. It's 736. It's O'Connor and Company. And uh, it's uh, a busy morning getting even busier. If you missed our conversation we just had. With the former chief of police for the Capitol Police, Stephen Sun, please subscribe to our podcast. It's the kind of content that we try to provide you so that you are better informed, certainly better informed than people who are watching cable news to start their day or, dare I say, listening to any other radio program to start their day. You'll be happy you're here. And if you miss any of it, get the podcast so you don't miss what happens when you're not here. Coming up at 8.05, Mike Cloud, Congressman of Texas, will join us, give us a report on what Donald Trump said when meeting with Republicans on Capitol Hill yesterday. I'm Larry O'Connor. Patrice Anwuka is here, uh, not one of the Republicans that met on Capitol Hill yesterday with Donald Trump, I'm told. No, no, it wasn't me, but, but you, you know, are, can't wait to hear about it. You have not been eliminated from the short list for running mate, though. I don't think I can be. Remember, I'm a naturalized citizen. I don't think the vice president has oh, that's to be. Right. An, we a, do need well, to. Yeah. Well, you know what? When we have the <laughs> Article 5 Convention of the States, we will address that. All right. Joining okay. us right now is Mike Clancy. Mike Clancy wants that nomination for the 10th Congressional District. 
Uh, Mike, thanks for joining us. Well, good morning, all, and happy Friday. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, to uh, tomorrow was the last day for early voting, and then we got the primary on Tuesday. What's the race looking like? It's a, it's a boy, people want this seat. This is going to be a highly contested election. It, it absolutely will be a uh, contested election. Uh, the control of the House of Representatives for Republicans runs through Virginia 10. You know, Virginia 10th District is my home, and, and I'm excited and I'm energized to be running for Congress. We've got tremendous momentum. You know, for the past eight months, I've traveled all over the district talking and listening to voters, Republicans, Democrats, independents, people who voted for Joe Biden and now have severe buyer's remorse. They're frustrated. They're agitated, Mm -hmm. they're struggling, and they're energized for change. They want to see an end to all the Biden chaos, the chaos at the border, in our economy, our cities, college campuses, globally. They're appalled by the reprehensible anti-Semitism of the radical left, and I'll be that change agent. I'll bring the conservative principles to Congress. I'll fight to end that chaos and fight to restore America. You know, Mike, <clears throat> it was so interesting to see President Trump um, on Capitol Hill yesterday. And I think the, the media's heads were on fire, a lot of them, because, you know, this is now the tr- the party of Trump. And it's a party that is p- very populist driven, but also draws in a lot of people who would never consider voting for Republicans, who who, who thought Republicans didn't care about them. Um, Talk to us about, you know, how you think that you can reach a lot of those voters in your district, uh, potential voters in your district who, you know, have felt either left out of the entire political process, don't feel, you know, want to believe, want to find a home um, and don't believe that the Democratic Party, even if they had that leaning before, is not the right place for them. What do you bring to the table? What's your pitch to those folks? Well, Patrice, I mean, the key issues that are in this campaign cross party lines. The three things that I hear about the most, number one, border security. People are frustrated with the border. They're deeply concerned with the human trafficking, which has now grown to a $10 billion industry under Joe Biden. The fentanyl, the Chinese fentanyl coming into uh, Central America, being routed through our country uh, by the cartels. We have it in our community. We've had over a dozen fentanyl overdoses in our Loudoun high schools. The second issue is the economy. Uh, People are struggling in the economy. Uh, You know, I talked with a woman the other day. She had just returned from the grocery store. She's a mother with two young children, and she's shocked by just how expensive it is to buy Mm -hmm. two bags of groceries. The third key issue that we hear from parents is it's education. It's the schools. It's a focus on parents' rights. It's a focus on uh, protecting the privacy and security of girls in bathrooms and in, in protecting girls' sports. It's all about its school choice and its homeschooling. Those are the kinds of issues that cross party lines. These are issues that are kitchen table issues that matter to people and will drive them to be voting uh, in, in for Republicans in 2024. Do you have an idea, if you were to win this House seat, what your priorities would be in terms of uh, committee assignments? What committees would you like to be on? What conversations would you like to have the most influence on if you were to get to the House of Representatives? Because I think that's reflective of how the people of the 10th District will be represented. Yes, Larry. So I think uh, if I could get it, I'd love to be on the Appropriations Committee. You know, Ronald mm. Reagan said about, you know, he said roughly 35 years ago is that the problem is not that people are taxed too little. The problem is the government spends too much. And if Ronald Reagan was alive today, he'd be shocked by all the reckless spending of Joe Biden and the Democrats. We need to rein in that reckless spending. We need to focus on bringing tax relief. You know, the, the Trump tax cuts are expiring in 2025. Yes. That, that will be the largest tax increase in history. And as the congressman for this district, I'll be leading the fight to make those tax cuts permanent. You know, um, Mike, how do you distinguish yourselves from from your other opponents in the field? I mean, I'm sure a lot of them agree with you when it comes to closing the southern border, agree that prices are too high and we need to bring inflation down. You know, but where do you see the differences between some of the the people that you're running against right now? Yeah, I'm the conservative in the race, and I'll bring my life experience as a husband and and father of four sons to, to to the congressional seat and my expertise in the Constitution and business 
national security and cybersecurity. I served on Governor Youngkin's cybersecurity team when he was elected. Mm. And these aren't just empty words. I have been and continue to be in the fight uh, for the people of Virginia's 10th district every day. I've been in the fight on the school issues, and that's why I've been endorsed by a lot of the leading education advocates like Ian Pryor. I've been advocating on the border issue, and have and I've been honored to earn the trust and endorsement of Loudoun County Sheriff Mike Chapman, who's the National Sheriff of the Year, because he trusts me to go to Congress to secure the border and to be a strong partner with local law enforcement to fight the human trafficking, to fight the crime, to fight the fentanyl crisis. And I've been in the, I'm the candidate who's been on the front lines and the data center fight in Prince William County, supporting the community to protect their homes, <clears throat> our national parks, the da- from the data center proliferation and those corridors of transmission lines. And in Congress, you know, I've committed to go to Congress to work for legislation that will pro- federal legislation to protect the parks, the neighborhoods, the schools from this data center proliferation and to address the energy issues and to protect the communities from these transmission line corridors. So I bring I bring that energy and that fight and that commitment. And these aren't just words. I've been in the fight and I continue to be in the fight. And that's why you see these all these endorsements on my website, because the community is lined up. They see they're, they're more motivated by action than by mere words. And that website is Mike Clancy for Mike Clancy for Congress.com. Sorry about that, Mike. We need to jump in here. Sure. Mike Clancy for Congress.com is the website. You've only got a few days left to make your choice. Primary is Tuesday, and on Wednesday, we'll know who won. Good luck, Mike. Well, Good I, talking with you. Thank you, and thanks, thanks very Mike. much. All Americans, both those who are well off and those who are near, near at the bottom of the income distribution, are better off now. Their wages have risen more than prices. All right, that's the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen. <laughs> She she woke up from a nap and she made that claim. Oh, All Americans, boy. those who are well off and those who are near the bottom of the income distribution are better off. Now, then CNBC host Andrew Ross Sorkin, Patrice, pressed her on one key issue, which is then why do the polls show that the American people think they were better off under Trump, if that's the case? And uh, then she revealed these details. I can remember when um, the price of a gallon of milk or a loaf of bread was... 30 percent lower than it is now. Yeah, that's why people think things are worse now than they were before, right? Seeing the level of prices rise um, quite a lot. I mean, over over 20 percent. Right. So how exactly are things better now than they were before? Low income families have seen some of the highest increase in costs. Patrice, is she campaigning for Donald Trump? It sounds like it because she's Uh, making the exact (laughs) argument we always make, which is, Inflation is eating away at your paycheck. So, yeah, your earnings on a nominal basis might have risen, but it's it's gobbled up by higher prices everywhere you turn. Right. So, yeah, she's doing a great job um, trying trying to campaign to stay in office if President Trump gets reelected. Maybe that's yeah. what it is. She wants to be renominated under all, Trump. All, she started <laughs> off by saying all Americans are better off now than they were before. And then she acknowledged that people remember when milk was 30 percent lower. That there's been a lot, a rise of prices over 20% on most things, and low income families have seen the highest rise in costs. But trust mm. me, everyone's better off than they were four years ago. <laughs> it's 753.